Isaacs. This is to the second uh, talk in our virtual series. Over the past month, uh, our unprecedented circumstance here has forced us to postpone many of our public talks and to ramp down our on-campus research. And during these weeks, we've been thinking a lot about how we can best stay in touch with our community, with you. And it's important to us to let you know what we're doing and to bring you into the broader scientific conversation. So we've created this virtual series to share our ongoing work and to introduce you to some of our our many talented Carnegie researchers. Those of you who joined us last week uh, were, were treated to the far reaches of our universe with John Mulcahy, who's the director of our Carnegie Observatories. And this week, we're coming back to Earth to hear from Moy Esposito Alonso. He's an evolutionary geneticist who studies plants to learn how they respond and adapt to climate change as biodiversity diminishes around the world. His lab works uh, at the intersection between evolutionary genetics, plant molecular biology, and ecology informatics. Our hope is that the work that Moy does and this knowledge that he gains will someday be helpful in identifying plant populations that are high risk because of climate change, and also to find ways to potentially genetically engineer those plants to adapt and avoid extinction. So let me just say a few words about Moy. He's really an exceptionally gifted researcher he first became intrigued by plant biology when he was growing up in Southern Spain. He saw with his own eyes how Mediterranean forests were being transformed, maybe even destroyed into deserts as a consequence of climate change. And after earning his bachelor's degree in biology from the Universidad de Sevilla, Moy went on to pursue a master's degree in quantitative genomics from the University of Edinburgh and in Scotland. He earned his PhD in ecological genomics from the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen in Germany, and he did a postdoc in statistical genetics at UC Berkeley. Uh, we're also proud of Moy this year. This year, Moy has been honored with the American Society of Naturalists, Jasper Loftus Hills, Young Investigator Award, and the Heidelberg Academy of Science, Carl Frudenberg Award Prize, and recently was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 Europe list in science and healthcare. So like all of you, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say to us today on this exciting, important, and urgent topic. So please join me now in welcoming my colleague, Moy Esposito Alonso. Moy. Thanks very much. Uh, I assume everybody can hear me. I'm unmuted now. Uh, thanks, Eric, for that very generous introduction. And uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks uh, also Natasha, Michelle, Brian, Sean for organizing these uh, public lectures to connect Carnegie researchers with, with colleagues in other fields and Carnegie friends in the broad public. I'm very excited to tell you about our work. So uh, I'm gonna share now my uh, presentation and we'll go through some slides. I assume you can, you can see it full screen. Otherwise uh, somebody will ping me. All right, uh, so in micro at Carnegie, uh, we study, oops, spoiler. Uh, we study um, fundamental processes of evolution, such as how adaptation to climate change or to climate in general is molecul molecularly encoded in the DNA and how we can use that knowledge to develop predictive models of future adaptation. Such change in climate that we're observing uh, has devastating consequences to ecosystems, uh, leading to an increase in wildfires as we've seen in California, in Australia, uh, coral bleaching or drought and desertification. As Eric mentioned, uh, I come from South Spain and it's an area that over the last century seems to have become drier and drier and uh, prone to desertification. The magnitude of biodiversity loss due to human impacts is really daunting, uh, with over 40 and 50% of all plant and animal species gone in the red areas that I'm gonna highlight with my pointer, hope you can see the pointer, in areas such as uh, North America or Europe, etc. I'm gonna say that the majority of these 
changes in biodiversity are really due to habitat destruction and exploitation, uh, not only climate change, but the way to avoid those, uh, those that are direct impacts should be relatively easy. Uh, we just have to stop exploiting a species or, or cutting a forest. We can create natural parks and this protection has helped in many areas. But a significant fraction of that biodiversity loss is also due to climate change. And researchers have found already direct evidences that climate is uh, shifting biodiversity patterns. For example, many species live nowadays a little bit northern, right? Searching for those colder areas. Um, and, uh, and the thing is that the impacts of climate change, which are indirect, affect all existence at once and cannot be remediated with a natural park. These impacts, in fact, are going to become of larger importance as climate change accelerates. And that is the reason that we ask whether a species can rapidly change and adapt to climate change and avoid extinction. We can address this as evolutionary geneticists. In fact, one of the most classic examples in uh, the evolutionary field is the rapid adaptation of this pepper moth species to a rapid change in the environment. These two moths are actually the same species, they are identical, except for uh, one mutation in the genome of the black one. These mutations essentially a change of letters in the code in the encyclopedia of the species. Due to industrial revolution and coal burning, forests darkened in many areas in the UK and the species changed, the dark one became more prevalent because predators did not see it. And this generated an overall turnover, genetic turnover of the population that enabled the species to persist. The paper mouth case is very nice because it's a very simple example with a single mutation, one environmental challenge. But can this happen in more complex cases, such as climate change that is multifaceted and where probably there will not be a single mutation or variant that can rescue a population from uh, extinction? So to answer this question, uh, we use the model system Arabidopsis thaliana, the equivalent of mice for plants, for plant research. Although it looks a little bit um, unimpressive, one could say, um, in the left, this model has multi-million dollar genetic resources and molecular know-how. We have large databases, some of them created by Carnegie scientists, and we can grow it very easily in our lab. This picture in the left is actually our growth chamber. But importantly, we can also find it in very pristine and surprising extreme environments, such as this sand dune, where I took a picture of a budding Arabidopsis. So to find whether there are genetic variants, these changes in letters in the genome of the species that could save it, from climate change, we generated a large scale rainfall reduction experiment in two locations, in Germany and in Spain. In Germany, as I was doing by then my PhD there. Uh, and we were doing it in Spain and Germany because Arabidopsis is native to Eurasia and Africa, North Africa. So in these tunnels, we simulated some type of accelerated climate change where we imposed some droughts. You know that droughts will likely be one of the major challenges for the persistence of plant communities. There we uh, planted the unparalleled number of 25,000 pots of with Arabidopsis, in total about half a million seeds, and in total 500 genetically distinct Arabidopsis varieties, quote unquote, that have been collected all over Europe. And that some of them might come from dunes, some of them might come from places like cities. And then we search for differences across the different Arabidopsis varieties in survival under this accelerated climate change experiment. And we found some shocking uh, differences. I mean, this 
uh, these two plants were in the same exact soil, completely dry, you could touch it and it, will, it, it, it would just uh, dissolve in your hands like sand. Um, but this one in the right seemed perfectly fine. This one in the left, of course, not so much. And we found a complete gradient between these two extremes of plants. The moth case was very, very simple. This is a much more complex case where we have these big gradients and we have a genome of, of these plants with uh, hundreds of small genetic differences. So the background of this slide is more or less what I see in my computer screen almost every day <laughs> of my daily life. And what we can read is ACTG. As you may know, uh, there are four molecules in the DNA of every species. That is the letters that we represent as letters ACTG. That is a way that uh, organisms code for amino acids and proteins and everything that is needed to define uh, how your body is, how your physiology is, et cetera. So our Arabidopsis has 150 million letters in this encyclopedia. And we have them actually, if we could go to the right to 150 million, we would have a string of letters uh, that is the genome of one of my Arabidopsis. In the rows, we have each of the 500 plants or varieties that I used. So we have their complete encyclopedias. If you have a very good eye, you might have spotted already some uh, different letters, but I'm gonna highlight it anyway. Um, oops. So here we have uh, more or less every 10 letters or 15 letters, we have one change that is different between any two Arabidopsis. And there are millions of them. There are about 10 million places in the genome, locations, locations in the genome where there are different letters. So using computer algorithms, I would try to find associations between having those letters that is a different genetic code and the survivability in the experiments. And for example, things that we would find are some letters, like the ones that I'm highlighting here, C and A, that code for something that is statistically associated with survival. So we would code the C letters as good as for survival, whereas the alternative letter, alternative version, as bad. So the more good versions that you would have of these letters, the better. And in fact, there were, we could identify many positions in the genome that explain this uh, survivability. This again is very diff different from the moth case. There's not a single letter, but there are many. What that means is that not a single mutation or change will uh, make the perfect plants, but there are, on the other hand, many ways in which they could adapt to climate change and it could be faster. Of course, in this experiment, I was studying hundreds of varieties, but in real populations across the native range, a population might not have these 500 varieties at its disposal to adapt, but perhaps those populations are unlucky and only have the bad variants. If so, they might become locally extinct. Despite this is so important, and we've seen these shocking differences in survivability of different genetic varieties, current uh, risk assessment tools and models for what is going to be the risk of losing biodiversity in this century do not account for genetic information yet. With Arabidopsis, where we have much more genetic knowledge, we can actually develop new models that incorporate genetic information to see what is the differential risk of populations uh, un under climate change. So the model that I created essentially checked in our database of wild Arabidopsis populations, which are all these dots that you see in this European map, how many good or bad versions they have and color them based on whether they were good or bad. 
So in red, we have populations where there are many of these bad genetic variants. So it seems that they might be at highest risk under future climate change. How I interpret this insight is that populations in Central Europe uh, currently have the genetic variants that are good under a wet weather or wet climates, but they're not good for the coming dry wave of lowering precipitation wave that is expected to come, as you can see in dark, uh, to 2050. So this is uh, one of, or the one published model that integrates complete genomic information as those tools used in biomedicine to predict disease, to predict an ecological threat in this century. The uh, following work to this project uh, is, can we actually predict whether a population will adapt or become extinct and, and when? We still really don't have the mathematical models for this. We could make these relative predictions of relative risk, but we cannot for sure know whether a, the, a population will collapse. To being able to improve these mathematical models, we're doing a crowdsourced experiment uh, in 45 laboratories across the world. So all these green dots that you see in this map to understand the environmental and demographic complexities of adaptation and extinction and to develop new mathematical models that can include genetics, environmental, and demographic information to predict these demographic outcomes. And I like to think of this experiment as the Klaus and Kekin Heisey experiment 2.0. Klaus and Kekin Heisey, you might know, were Carnegie scientists that in the 1940s, in, my, in the department where I'm currently at, in the Department of Plant Biology at Stanford, uh, did the first transplanting experiments of different varieties of the same California flora between Stanford and sites in Yosemite or near Yosemite to show that evolution and adaptation was already happening between populations at different altitudes. So I like to think that we're following their leg legacy by doing these transplant experiments, but using genomic information and in the context of climate change. All right, so I've shown you that Arabidopsis is a fantastic model that allows us to be in the frontier of method development to connect genomic knowledge and ecological knowledge. But a bigger question that my lab and many other labs are thinking of or, or should be thinking of is will entire ecosystems adapt or be resilient to climate change? At least one dimension of this resilience we know about, and is that the more genetically diverse these ecosystems are, the more uh, adaptable they will be. So in the future, uh, we're thinking of long-term efforts on how to monitor genetic diversity of species and ecosystems at a large scale and scale up our evolutionary genetic models to many more species. And we're taking a big data analytics approach, our lab and many others. So there are three types of genetic data, uh, of, of data generally that are exploding. The first one is genetic data, is increasing exponentially in databases. Everybody is sequencing different species, every university and research center. And people think that or claim that by 2030, we might have sequenced all the eukaryote uh, species in the world. So once we have one individual of a species completely sequenced, that is we have the blueprint of how, what is the string of letters of all the encyclopedia, it becomes very feasible to sequence hundreds of individuals of the same species and see small slight variations between them, allowing ecologists to modern and monitor their study populations across the world. And many colleagues in uh, the University of California are leading um, a very interesting approach that is called Cal eDNA, where they're systematically sequencing many species of uh, the ecosystems in California. 
So now, genetic diversity is the first dimension of organization at the uh, deepest molecular level. Once we have done this, which we have done for our Arabidopsis and a number of other species, we need to connect this to the next level of biodiversity or organization, which is what is species exist in an ecosystem. So we need to build geographic, complete geographic maps of all the species lists in ecosystems across the world. There are lots of databases that we can use for this. For example, the humongous Global Biodiversity Information Facility with over a billion geographic records of animal and plants partially fed by new apps that people I recommend you install like iNaturalist or Seek, where you can take pictures of whatever you see out there. Uh, machine learning algorithms identify them with different accuracies and then send those records to databases such as GBIF that then I analyze in my computer. These records are most abundant as you can see uh, in this density map of records in North America and Europe. To fill the gap on our knowledge across the world, we can use a third uh, exploding type of data, which is satellite data. We go fill in geographic gaps of sampling of species and ecosystem types, thanks to its high resolution, sometimes even better than one meter resolution. Uh, and where even some organisms such as trees can be directly observed. Also, because they take pictures almost every day, we can track vegetation changes at a very high temporal resolution. Many times probably we can even track impacts on ecosystems faster than local, locals report them. And one uh, excellent example on the use of this data is the Global Forest Watch that has been monitoring losses in forests, as you can see in purple in this map in the last couple of decades. So I believe that uh, integrating these different data sets and with in creative ways and with new computational resources, we can one day create a Google Earth tool that quantifies genetic diversity assets and therefore adaptability of ecosystems across the world. Hopefully my lab can contribute to some of this. But now I want to end with two examples that are a little bit more tangible that we're doing in these directions and that we just started. Two keystone species for which we have connected uh, genetic information and for which there's also up uh, until um, uh, recently satellite information. The first is a new genomic database of aspen trees, quick in aspen, that we're analyzing in collaboration with my colleague Ben Blonder from UC Berkeley. You might know of the so-called sudden aspen decline. In the last 20 years, these aspen forests have been in rapid decline. So you can see pictures uh, where essentially all the trees don't have any leaves. And this is not because it's winter. It's just they, they blossomed forever, they died. And this map represents in purple areas where sudden aspen decline has been monitored. So Ben has been monitoring a population in Colorado of 500 trees and generated a genomic data set that we begin analyzing. And what we found is that the damage in trees, that loss of, of branches, leaves, et cetera, is significantly explainable by the genomic uh, makeup of the different trees, meaning there must be genetic variants like in our Vidopsis that make trees more or less susceptible to the changes in climate in the last couple of years. So one of our next step is to try to map these high resilient genetic varieties throughout the US to anticipate forests that might be more susceptible to this rapid decline and potentially guide, for example, restoration approaches if we know what is the best seed so uh, sourcing for re reforestation. Another example is a recent project that it's this very preliminary that we started working with a PhD student in my lab, analyzing uh, what I like to call the trees of the seas, corals. 
Uh, so we've gathered three databases from previously published study, uh, studies of three species. We're starting to look at the overall genetic diversity of the three species in areas in Japan, the Great Reef, and some other Pacific islands. In the first analysis, the preliminary analysis indicate that the genetic diversity is much lower than what people in the marine biology field expected. People thought that cor corals might be like trees with pretty high genetic diversity, like aspen, 1%, but they have much lower. So, uh, and this confirms a pu the published paper from Fuller et al. Uh, last year. So integrating these three uh, data sets, we're trying to map regions that might be more vulnerable uh, genetically. So more to report in the next talk. So today we've seen that genetic diversity is an essential component uh, that fuels evolutionary adaptation. And I actually, I actually think we're overlooking this dimension of diversity. I think it's gonna be a natural capital of the 21st century that is threatened. Genetic diversity is adaptability, and this will be required for the sustainability of resources and services that our societies depend on. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, today we've seen that we can develop genetic models in a study system, or Arabidopsis taliana, that help us understand ecological threats from climate change, starting from uh, the genetic level. In the future, we need to start scaling up tools. And I've told you some ideas that I have for doing this. Ultimately trying to understand whether whole ecosystems will respond and adapt to climate change. And that's, this will probably depend strongly on their genetic assets. As an evolutionary geneticist, uh, me and my group, we can try to build better predictive models of population adaptability and threats we can devise even genetic remediation approaches such as this new uh, assisted migration of the best genetic seed sourcing, or even we can think of gene editing. Uh, but as citizens and the broad public, we have to ask whether we can afford uh, the natural and economic risk of losing genetic diversity. And if not, we need to ask uh, policymakers to devise conservation approaches that also take into account this dimension of biodiversity. And with that, I want to thank everybody that has been listening and I'm very happy to chat more about all these topics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moy, for such an excellent talk. And we've had a lot of people, we have just shy of 500 people listening in on Zoom and another hundred about on YouTube. So. Uh, I know that people have really enjoyed it um, and we have a lot of questions. So let's go ahead and get right to them. Uh, we have a question from Peter Olson who asks, what does it mean when you say sequence a species? How do you uh, account for individual variations in DNA when you're doing so? Yeah. So that's that's an excellent question. Should I, by the way, stop sharing my screen or? Um, yep, okay, I'll stop sharing the screen so people can actually see me. Okay, yeah, excellent question. So when, when we say sequencing a species, typically we mean we sequence a single individual, right? It, it, can, be, um, it can be just your preferred variety or just the one that you have at hand in the laboratory. And once you sequence it, that is you read this encyclopedia, you put together that blueprint, so which is you know, uh, identical, there's no variation within, within that individual. And then what that does is that that creates a blueprint that you can use then to compare with other individuals. So you can go out and then search for other varieties that might live in more extreme climates or less extreme climates and see uh, and, and compare those. So we have another question uh, from William Chin, who wants to know um, if climate change is affecting the mutation rates of or plants, Arabidopsis and others, 
through in ways such as you increased UV exposure or other things like that? Is that a factor in this mm -hmm. crisis? That is an excellent question. Um, yeah, it's. I don't think. I don't think it's known. It is definitely known that the mutation rates can uh, increase under uh, stressful environments. This has been shown in the species Scherichia coli. There is a laboratory bacteria model system. Uh, there is um, there's some evidence that it might be the case in Arabidopsis, but I, so far, uh, and therefore probably in other plants. So far, I. I haven't seen too many evidence, too many convincing evidence for that, uh, but it's also much more difficult to calculate that mutation rates in a plant than in E. coli, because to do that, you have to grow your plant for many generations, right? In E. coli, you can have one generation every 25 minutes. In, in Arabidopsis, we can have one generation maximum every, every couple of months. Uh, so typically these experiments take a long time, and to maintain an Arabidopsis under a stressful condition that might kill it for many generations is, is quite difficult. But that is something that I'm very interested in doing and uh, uh, my, my laboratory will be doing this kind of experiments. So it is, in summary, it is possible that an increase in temperature, not, probably not so much uh, UV, um, would, could increase the mutation rate, but so far we don't know. One of the things that's so great about our Carnegie audience is, is that they ask these sophisticated and informed questions. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so very, exciting very to, yeah. to read through them. So we have another uh, question from Peter and he wants to know from the perspective of gardeners and land managers, are there ways to intentionally plant plants that uh, are known to have more resilient genomes uh, to sort of plan ahead mm -hmm. now in the future? Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's great. Um, so I think I I would recommend everybody, particularly in the garden side, <laughs> uh, everybody to to be in touch with the with the local uh, floristic and conservation communities, uh, which often have uh, lots of advice on what plants are native and therefore are going to be resilient. To the type of weathers that exist, of course, the weathers are gonna are gonna change. But if you try to find those, for example, in California, instead of having a, a lawn, you, you try to have uh, native California plants. Uh, that uh, that will probably be a more sustainable way to have to have your garden. In a larger scale, in in food production uh, systems, said so you know, like in, in agriculture, there are lots of there's lots of ongoing research trying to find varieties that are uh, that are more resilient to to climate change if the last green revolution was to ramp up productivity uh, to to feed the world this new revolution is going to be to ramp up resilience and there are many people thinking on how to do this from a genetic perspective definitely the types of models that we use Trying to uh, trying to mimic what nature has done, or try to find what nature has done. What are the genetic footprints that tell us how plants from extreme environments have coped? Uh, can inform a lot of the, or can guide a lot of the breeding programs in in species. And people are, are doing this and thinking about this. That's fantastic. And uh, we actually had several other questions come in about, uh, about that same topic um, as you were answering just um, what this biodiversity loss means for crops and, and do we need to worry about loss of food sources looking forward? Yeah, I also recommend uh, people to read the latest assessment of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This is the equivalent to the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change that in the 90s and the 2000s did the climate projections for this century. Now an equivalent exists for biodiversity and ecosystem, system, uh, ecosystem services. 
and they published a report that is relatively small with um, advice for the broad public and, and policy makers. And they have some very interesting figures. And one of them is the huge decline in the uh, land races or different varieties in crops and, um, and, and other farm animals that were used last century or a few centuries ago and now. So everything has become uh, towards homogenization and, and, and using elite varieties. And we've dropped many of these land races that actually might be more resilient. So, so there are lots of efforts in trying to recover this resilience, maintain genetic diversity of crops and, and animal farm animals. Um, and, uh, and this is, in this report, they actually, in the, the only area to my, to my knowledge that actually mentions genetic diversity needs to be preserved is in the context of uh, domesticated animals and plants. So there are efforts on that, but we shouldn't forget that it is important to also maintain genetic diversity of wild species. And that uh, even though they, they might not be domesticated, they might inspire us to guide domestication of some others or to guide improvement and resilience of elite varieties. So highly recommended to go to Google and search Intergovernmental Pan, a platform on biodiversity in ecosystem services and, and read about, uh, about the potential plans in conservation for this decade. Anyone who's interested, we can email the link to that. Uh, yes, absolutely. At the end of yeah, the And program. feel free to reach by email, yeah. Um, so we have a question from John who is wondering uh, if the, the work that you're doing could also be used to analyze other threats to plants like diseases or blights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's excellent question. I am focused on on climate adaptation. Uh, much of the much of the I think future work to do will be to learn how to incorporate species interactions in our modeling. And species, species interactions means uh, both facilitator species, uh, herbivores, uh, pathogens, and all those things. So I think we could start adding biotic layers to our predictions. So uh, interaction layers to our, our predictions that incorporate uh, this kind of effects. Those models become extremely complicated. If we are having a hard time trying to predict just the response to climate of a single species, uh, the complexity of those models, including more and more species and their genetics, uh, it, it just goes exponential. So I think uh, perhaps I'm too optimistic, but I feel like this, in these decades, um, we're gonna be able to confidently start predicting evolutionary and adaptation responses to specific climate pressures in single species. I have the feeling that then there's going to be lots of work to do to being able to incorporate those species interactions of pathogens and, and other things. So the, the question is on point. We still have to think a lot about what models we can develop. It's fantastic. I mean, it's always so impressive. The, the things that people come up with as they listen to our speakers and uh, our audience. Yeah, the questions are so wonderful. smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a question from William who asks, we hear a lot about um, in, in human development, the role of epigenetics. Is that a thing that exists in plants? And, and if so, uh, is it affected by climate change? <clears throat> yeah, excellent question too, <laughs> and pretty difficult to answer. Um, so yes, epigenetic, epigenetic marks also exist in plants and they can be responsive to the environment like in mammals. Uh, the 
the inheritance of epigenetic marks in plants are, it's indeed more conserved than in, in humans. So you could imagine that there is a little bit more memory from the previous environment, from the mom's environment to the offspring environment than in mammals. So, so that could be promising. And I think there are many ecologists and evolutionary geneticists that have been thinking about this. However, that inheritance is not perfect and often reverses. So in the long term, and given the magnitude of climate change, I think a sustained response every generation improving resilience will require genetic adaptation. But epigenetics or other molecular mechanisms and physiological mechanisms that buffer environmental impacts will within a generation probably, uh, probably allow some, uh, some populations to survive. But that, because that doesn't carry on every generation, uh, it cannot provide that sustained response. So that's also what focus on genetic adaptation. Fantastic. And we have a question asking about, um, you know, most other than the uh, part about coral, most of your presentation was about uh, land-based plants. What about what's going on in the ocean with algae, which we know plays a significant role in uh, providing our oxygen and such? Yeah, I have to say that I am a terrestrial ecologist <laughs> and uh, I am quite ignorant on the marine environment. Uh, my understanding is that, well, the, the case of corals is quite special uh, since this, uh, from this report that I was mentioning before, since the 70s, 50% uh, of all the coral populations in the world seem to have uh, died out. And it's expected that in the next decade, uh, that, that number might reach the 90% of all the coral populations that existed, uh, you know, one century ago. Um, regarding algae, absolutely. I think the, the question is on point. Um, they will probably have to adapt to different temperatures, acidification of the ocean, etc. cetera. Uh, I think our degree of knowledge of those processes happening in the ocean might be, uh, might be skimmer than in terrestrial ecosystems. So I, I don't have a, a definite answer for that, but definitely uh, phytoplankton are a big part of the cycle of CO2, a big part of net um, primary productivity of, of the earth. And we should also look into that. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on that. So probably my answer is not so satisfactory as others. <laughs> well, that's part of the fun of these kinds of programs is it's, you know, you never know what you're going to get asked and um, yeah. it shows the huge diversity of knowledge that exists in this world. We have time yeah. for a couple more questions. We have one from Nick that is uh, going back to the basics asking, um, mm -hmm. so how did Ara Arabidopsis get chosen as this plant mm -hmm. so much research is done on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Great question. Uh, it's it's a little bit of serendipity uh, and is a lot about uh, pragmatism. So our um well, the serendipity is that it was uh, studied by a couple of geneticists uh, back in the eighties, and and that you know was promoted and established, and you know it just happened to be that. But it has a, a number of properties that make it particularly suitable to have it in the lab. First, it's, a, it's very tiny, as you could see from, from my slides. So we can just grow it in, in a normal room, like in your house, you could just have Arabidopsis growing. In fact, I normally have a pot in my office to show students when they pop up. <laughs> um, and um, so that's, that's very convenient. We can have thousands of them in a, in a normal room doesn't require much to grow. It has a tiny genome. It has uh, 150 million uh, letters in its genome, just for uh, reference. 
humans have three billion, right? Billion nine zeros. Um, so that makes it easier to sequence the genome, read it, see differences from one another. Another advantage is that it can reproduce with itself. So in the flowers, the flowers are hermaphrodites and the pollen of a flower can uh, fertilize its own flower. And that is very convenient because you just, you don't depend on having to cross with a pollinator depending on a bee, you know, you, you don't need having bees in your lab, <laughs> uh, but other plants do, and they have sophisticated genetic mechanisms to avoid that the pollen, uh, your own pollen uh, fertilizes yourself. And Arabidopsis doesn't have that uh, genetic lock. So that's, that's very useful. Uh, so there's, there's a number of practical reasons that it was chosen for this. It's also in the family of mustards where we have lots of vegetables that we eat. We have uh, all kind of things like broccoli, etc. Very close relative, cabbage, etc. So I think th those are the practical reasons that it was chosen. I'm gonna think about Arab Arabidopsis when I eat broccoli for dinner tonight. Yes. <laughs> So we have time for one last question. Unfortunately, we have many that we did not get to, but if anyone wants to submit their question via email to events at carnegiescience.edu, we will make sure those get passed along to Moy and that you will get answers uh, because we so appreciate you tuning in and taking the time and engaging with us uh, during this way. So we, for our last question, we have several people who have written and asked, um, if there is a way that they can contribute to your work through some kind of citizen science uh, efforts. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, well, the, I think what I would recommend everybody is if you go in hikes, um, take your phone with you with these apps like iNaturalist, we can send the link around or put it in Twitter or in the website. Um, and identify species. It might sound like it's uh, mostly for, for your pleasure, but it actually helps us a, a lot to, to being able to have uh, dense records of species all over the world that we can use for modeling and for tracking biodiversity over time. So hopefully we start doing this uh, more and more, more commonly and we, can, and we can do those records. Um, uh, or we can have those records more complete. In the terms of genetics, we just have to uh, keep going, uh, send smart, uh, brilliant people, creative people, uh, passionate people um, to, to us to work, <laughs> to work with us and, and to just help out. Okay, thank you so much. Thank and we'll have concluding remarks from our president, Eric Isaacs. So Moy, thanks very much. That was a, a great talk. And I hope everyone sees the importance of this kind of fundamental research to really addressing some of the big challenges we face, whether in all species, whether it's in the animal world or the plant world. And, uh, and you know, really appreciate the kind of stuff you do, Moy. So thank you very much for that great talk. I also wanna thank all of you, your participants for taking the time to be with us today. We're delighted to have so many people join us uh, for these conversations. And I hope you'll join us again, uh, virtually of course, to learn about the many ways that we at Carnegie, our Carnegie scientists are improving our understanding of cosmos, of our planet and of, of life itself, as you heard today. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you in two weeks on April 30th at this same time, when we'll hear from a microbial ecologist, Will Ludington, uh, and then two weeks after that, on May 14th, we'll hear from, we'll move back out to the cosmos and hear Gwen Rudy and Nick Conadaris talk about uh, a discussion of astronomy made possible by some really remarkable new capabilities of modern, what I call 21st century, very large telescopes. So again, thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you're enjoying this as much as I know many of us are. <laughs>